me and, and putting up with me uh, slowly responding to things. I had a talk I gave yesterday to a homebrew club in Brazil. And on Thursday night last week, I was talking to uh, Lawrence, Kansas club. So I, I get those all sort of jumbled together. Um, I'm not even sure we discussed exactly what I was going to be talking about. So I'm happy. I've, I've got a couple of presentations I can go through if, if people want to hear about sour beers or um, more generally about sort of like my feelings about home brewing. Um, but please take yourself off mute and um, ask questions. I really love um, these sorts of things when they're more interactive. And so if I say something that is uh, intriguing or that you want to hear more about or anything like that, um, please uh, stop me and um, ask. I'll try to be relatively brief. Um, if you have questions about anything I've discussed or something else that I've written or uh, said on a podcast or whatever, um, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, there's a lot of me talking on the internet and uh, if you just want to listen to me talk, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But if you want to ask questions or whatever, I'm, I'm happy to speak off the cuff um, in, in that case too. Um, but unless anyone has any questions they want to like answer, you know, talk about right off the bat, I'm happy just to jump into a talk. I think there was, I think there was a, a ask from a lot of the membership for, regarding the uh, sours, sour and funky styles. So. Sure. Happy to do it. Um, I've got, let's see, what do we want to do? I'll just do my regular old, uh, that one? Yeah, that one. Um, this one is sort of somewhere between you're starting a brewery that does sour beers and you're a serious home brewer who really wants sort of the, the basics on um, different methods for souring. If that sounds good, I'll, I'll uh, get going on it and if, uh, let's see, screen share, and there, and share, and slideshow, and from beginning. Is that showing up for everybody? It's right here, yeah. Cool. Excellent. Um, I'll, I'll go through this. It's probably 45 minutes or so, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions afterwards and um, discuss or whatever. So just a little background for those who don't know me. Um, I probably didn't put this in really chronological order, but sort of the biggest part of my life at the moment is uh, running Sapwood Cellars. Uh, we're a brewery that opened in three years ago, almost three years ago in September. My partner is Scott Janish, who some of you may know from his book, The New IPA, or his blog, uh, scottjanish.com or his various appearances uh, on, on other stuff. Um, we do a good deal of sour beer. We have a dedicated souring facility with about 70 oak barrels in it. Plus we have um, some dedicated stainless that we do um, some slightly quicker turn stuff in. We also do hazy IPAs and big silly stouts and, and a lot of sort of in-between stuff. Almost all our beer is served through the, the tap room. So we, um, have to have a nice variety because we have a lot of people who come in who maybe don't want a double IPA or an imperial stout or a barrel aged sour red with uh, cherries. So we do some pilsners and some brown ales and, and some weirder stuff too. Um, before that, uh, probably most people knew me from writing American Sour Beers for Brewers Publication in 2014. Um, it was sort of a labor of love. I spent three years writing it, um, interviewing it's, it's amazing how much the sour beer landscape has changed just in that you know, seven or so years. Um, I really felt like I could interview just about every brewery that was doing sour beer seriously back then. Um, and in the seven years since, there have just been uh, dozens of breweries that have uh, started brewing sort of world-class sour beers in the United States anyway. And um, honestly, I'm starting to, you know, I talk to um, homebrew clubs in Canada and Brazil and wherever else, I'm, I'm hearing about a lot more breweries internationally that are um, getting into sour beers using local fruits or local barrels or local um, foraged ingredients. And it's, um, I'm, I'm not sure I could even attempt to write an updated version of the book at this point. There's just so much going on that it would be overwhelming. Um, I also write the blog, The Mad Fermentationist, although write is probably a, a strong word since my last 
post was probably more than a year ago at this point. Um, I was a, an economist for the uh, federal government here in the US for 10 years. And for some reason, getting home at five o'clock from a government job after, you know, work on spreadsheets all day, writing about beer felt like this, you know, wonderful creative release, this outlet. Uh, but these days I do all the social media for Sapwood. I write all our blog posts. And um, so my personal blog is taking a little bit of a, a backseat. Um, I do occasionally write for Brew Your Own magazine. For a while it was every, uh, every issue and now it's sort of once a year if I, if I can get to it. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about sour beer. Um, I'm going to go through sort of a lot of different processes for making sour beer. One of the really fantastic things about sour beer, I think, is that the process really varies from brewery to brewery, from brewer to brewer, um, much more so than um, any other style or even, honestly, all of the clean styles put together. Um, just as a sort of for example, this is a beer we call Order to Chaos. Um, it's a series we do that is um, when we go into the barrel cellar and there are some barrels that were passed over for whatever reason, usually it's something like, um, you know, we filled four barrels with a dark Saison and one of them finished uh, five or 10 points higher than the rest. If we were to blend that in with the rest of the barrels, sort of in that intended release, um, the sugars that were residual in that higher gravity beer might end up fermenting and causing um, excess carbonation, you know, weird flavors to develop, whatever it is. So it gets put to the side. And then in this case, we had a barrel of Flanders Red that was in the same position, finished a little high. We want a little bit more acidity. So we add some cranberry juice and some dried cranberries. And then we finished it with some orange zest. So sort of a, like a cranberry sauce, winter sour beer release. Um, it was really fun, but it's also the sort of thing that's almost impossible to recreate because it was these two different beers aged in two specific barrels that we then blended together. So it's um, sort of a one-off kind of thing for us. Obviously, if the you know, result was really fantastic, we'd figure out a way maybe to brew a base beer that had some of those same you know, or similar notes. Um, but yeah, I and mean, when, when you talk to brewers about souring beer, um, the order of operations is not even the same from brewery to brewery. You know, when you talk about brewing a Pilsner versus a stout, um, pretty much the, the step by step is the same. You know, you mix whatever grains you're, you're using with hot water, you mash them, you sparge it, you boil it with some amount of hops, probably, you cool it to some temperature, pitch some amount of yeast, you wait for fermentation to go on, you know, you package it. Um, and that's sort of the same, you know, hey, maybe there's a little wrinkle if you're dry hopping or a little wrinkle if you're doing a, a Whirlpool hop edition versus just a 60 minute edition. Um, maybe you add another, you know, a, a chocolate or coffee to the stout after fermentation is complete. But really um, you sort of recognize the steps of any recipe. And honestly, I kind of, when I look at recipes for beer, I'll sort of skim over the step-by-step step because I know when the hops, you know, go in from the, you know, the list of ingredients and, I don't need the how much water I heat and, and whatever. Um, when it comes to sour beer though, um, really each of these, so there's sort of two big main categories I'll talk about, quicker sours and longer term sours. But within those, there are sort of individual, um, you know, sort of uh, niches. So, you know, kettle souring where you're, uh, you know, pitching lacto first, getting the pH down and then boiling to kill the lacto before proceeding with a clean fermentation. You can do a mixed fermentation. That's what we do for our Berliner Weisses and our Gozas, where we're um, co-fermenting with lactobacillus and brewer's yeast and often Brettanomyces, but pretty quick and in stainless steel. Um, there are also lactic acid producing yeast like uh, you know, Philly Sour or Sour Vissier from Lallemand. Um, and even within those, there are going to be different breweries that um, change the order of steps. You, know, you might boil your kettle sour before souring and then just pasteurize it afterwards. You might, uh, for your mixed ferment, um, pitch lacto first or pitch it together or, you know, get the fermentation done and then do bread or maybe do 100% bread to no brewer's yeast. Um, and lactic acid yeast are, are a little more straightforward, but, you know, sort of depending on how you want to control the acidity with additions of glucose or pitching rates or things like that. And then really uh, long-term sours um, usually in barrels and again with, you know, different mixes of microbes and different, you know, if you add fruit early on or you add fruit late or you um, 
do a spontaneous uh, ferment, you know, starting in a cool ship or you pitch microbes or, um, you know, all of those things are going to make a very different result. Um, and when I talk to brewers, I mean, it's sort of, that's a classic brewing thing, you know, ask 10 brewers, get 11 answers. Um, and that really was the case for pretty much all of these things in sour beer. Um, so I'm going to go through each of these and just sort of give you some um, practical advice on um, how to do this souring method, uh, the sorts of beers that I think it really sort of uh, benefits the most, um, some drawbacks, some um, advantages. So again, um, I'll ask for questions a couple of times, you know, sort of in, in between the styles and please do uh, chime in if you have a question. So I think the, the souring method that sort of most uh, breweries do and, and sort of is most accessible is kettle souring. Um, the big advantage of kettle souring is that you're reducing the risk of cross-contamination. Um, when you make sour beers, sort of your number one goal is not to make good sour beer, it's to make sure your non-sour beers don't become sour beers. Um, at the brewery, we do a lot of um, separate equipment. So anything that's like a gasket or a soft part hose, um, anything that's plastic. Um, as a home brewer, you know, I had a separate auto siphon, a separate, um, uh, I, some separate kegs, some separate keg lines, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, these microbes are resourceful, for lack of a better phrasing. Um, Britannomyces from a very low cell count can ferment dextrins, can uh, really uh, make trouble. And, and once it sort of gets out into your system, it's a sort of whack-a-mole. It's going to pop up. And if you give a beer a long time, you know, if you're trying to do a longer age, you know, say an imperial stout uh, that you're bottle conditioning and you give it, you know, six months, that bread is really is going to be thriving in that environment. And then by then it's in every single thing you've got and you've just sort of got burned the whole thing down. Um, I wouldn't worry about doing sour beers in the same house. They don't have legs. They tend not to be airborne in the case of Britannomyces. Um, all that being said, kettle souring is pretty bulletproof. So the general approach that I advocate is uh, mash like you normally would. You can mash hot if you want some residual sweetness. You can mash cool if you want it to be dry. Um, chill it down. I'm sorry. So you know, get into your kettle. Bring it up to 175, 180. Um, pasteurization happens within a couple of minutes at those temperatures. Chill it down to whatever temperature your lactobacillus sort of thrives at. Usually that is, you know, in the sort of um, 40 degree Celsius kind of range. Um, pitch lactobacillus, get it as sour as you want to get it, boil it, and then at that point it's, uh, you've killed all the lacto, and then you can rent through your clean gear and not worry about it. Um, so um, you can just pitch brewer's yeast, whatever you want. You can make a sour saison like that by pitching saison yeast. You can make a sour wheat beer by pitching, uh, you know, a, a German Hefeweizen strain. You can make a clean beer um, and just ferment as normal, treat as normal. We'll talk a little bit about maybe some um, uh, preventative measures you can take to make sure that yeast is happy and healthy at that lower pH, but in general, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, introducing that lactobacillus to your uh, clean gear. Um, the big advantage to me is it gives you a lot of control over the acidity. So you can wait, and if you've got pH meter or pH strips, you can keep testing that wort as it sours. Um, I don't worry too much about introducing oxygen at that stage. Um, sour mashing, which I'm not gonna really talk about, has the big disadvantage of you're using grain to inoculate uh, the wort to, or the mash in that case, to uh, get the acidity. And grain dust is covered in lactobacillus, but it is also covered in all sorts of other things, including aerobic bacteria that make really awful smells. Um, I don't know how many people have forgotten to clean out a mash tun for a couple of days. At the brewery, we have big totes that we fill up with our spent grain. And like today, the farmer hadn't shown up in about a week because we hadn't been doing much brewing in the last week. And that, that spent grain was awful. Right? It was, you know, like rotten cheese and garbage and, you know, pretty much everything you wouldn't want a beer to taste like is what that spent grain smelled like. Um, but you've got some control over the acidity, so you can just keep measuring it. Um, and when it gets to the right pH, that's when you can boil. The big disadvantage of that is that you might hit the right pH at 
2 a.m. on a you know Monday morning. You were hoping to boil on Sunday and finish up the batch. Hey, it's it's now uh, you know pretty late, and so you have to be willing to either dose in a little lactic acid or really you know have your schedule uh, revolving around a beer souring. Um, the biggest drawbacks to me are that um, you know it's not a very exciting beer. Generally, is made by um, kettle souring. Um, you have to be there to pasteurize when the target pH is achieved. You may have issues with that primary ferment, and I'll talk about uh, that. It's also energy intensive. As a home brewer, that's probably not a big deal, but as a commercial brewery, I'm bringing 320 gallons of uh, what is that? You know, 1,200 liters of wort up to temperature, then I'm using water to chill it down, then I'm boiling it back from you know, 40 C, then I'm chilling again with more water. Um, so really, you know, it's sort of probably using twice, you know, twice the water and twice the energy as a, a more traditional uh, method. So some general sort of tips, um, I would not add any hops pre-souring. Lactobacillus is really like when you hear about uh, Lambic brewers adding aged hops to help preserve the beer and to help prevent spoilage, like lactobacillus is the main thing they're trying to stop. Um, I mean, you can add two or three IBUs if you really want, it'll probably be okay, but you're not gonna taste two or three IBUs anyway. If you want sort of hop character in a beer like this, I would wait until after souring is complete. So you could do a low temperature whirlpool to add you know, hop flavor, hop, hop aroma, or you could even dry hop it if you wanted to say a sour IPA. Um, I would suggest growing up your own lacto uh, those advice, that advice there is for commercial brewers, but, you know, sort of, uh, I, I often make a one or a two gallon starter for a 320 gallon batch. So, you know, like 1% of the volume is fine. So as a home brewer, you know, like a, a cup starter even is, is perfectly acceptable. Lacto grows very quickly, but it's sort of um, nice to have that insurance that you can, you know, taste that starter that you made the day before, two days before, and know that that lactobacillus is working and that you aren't just sort of leaving unprotected wort um, you know, to the mercy of wild microbes. Um, lactobacillus can double in something like 20 minutes in ideal condition. So, I mean, you know, if you start time zero with one cell, after an hour, you've got, what is that, eight. After two hours, you're at you know, 124. And after 24 hours, you can be at 175 quadrillion or something like that. So um, as long as that lacto is viable, you'll be fine. Um, we're big fans of the Omega Lacto Blend. Um, I think it does a good job. It's temperature tolerant. It is pretty aggressive, but not crazy. I've had good luck too with the Y Yeast and the White Labs Lactobacillus Brevis strains. I've had good luck with uh, Good Belly. I don't know if they are in Canada, but they're a, a probiotic bland, uh, brand that has uh, Lactobacillus plantarum. Um, that is uh, a pretty good option if you, you know, can't get a fresh pitch or it's summertime, it's hundred degrees out and you're debating ordering from somewhere where it's gonna be shipped and might not you know, be treated well. Uh, before you sour, I'd suggest uh, pre-acidifying your wort with lactic acid. Um, we usually target 4.3 or 4.4. Um, the biggest advantage of that is it limits uh, the breakdown of proteins by lactobacillus. So um, that's one of the big things that leads to like really poor head retention on a sour beer and sort of lack of body. Um, and getting that pH down a little bit first, it's a very small amount since pH is logarithmic. It's only about 10% of the acid required to get down into the, the mid threes. Um, if you were doing a spontaneous sour, say you were just throwing in a handful of grain to sour, that lower pH also helps to inhibit things like uh, enteric bacteria, uh, E. coli, salmonella, uh, you know, sort of um, real spoilage slash uh, pathogenic uh, microbes. Um, you always hear that uh, beer is safe if, you know, because fermentation is safe, but when you're doing either a spontaneous fermentation or a kettle sour, or, or honestly just not pitching yeast immediately, um, if that pH doesn't get down, uh, word is a great home for all sorts of nasty microbes. Uh, my friend, uh, Matt Humbard, who uh, does the Milk the Funk podcast and is starting a brewery of his own, and I did a uh, article for Brewer Magazine a couple years ago where uh, he tested, because he's a scientist, uh, the final pH that a bunch of different lactobacillus strains achieved at four different temperatures. Um, and sort of the main things to take away from this are like the White Labs lactobacillus Dobrookii did not do a great job. 
Um, you can see all four of those bars, regardless of the temperature, it didn't make it down below about 4.3. Um, I checked the pH of our Pilsner this morning, it was 4.2. So I, if you can't get more sour than a, than a classic Pilsner, um, it's probably not a great strain. Um, I've heard a lot of complaints from a lot of brewers about that strain. Just probably not worth the, uh, the, the headache. Uh, Lactobacillus buchneri is the standard uh, Y yeast lactose strain. I think it's 5335. That one is the most temperature sensitive. So if you see there at 37 or 39, right in the middle, it got decently sour and 35 is sort of tart, tangy, but not, you know, sort of sharply acidic. But if you go a little bit cooler at uh, 30C or a little bit warmer at, what is that, 42 hiding behind my uh, sidebar, it didn't sour quite as well. Um, that's one that might be a good option if you really do just want a very light acidity, but um, is a little bit tricky to work with. The Brevis and Plantarum listed there are both the single isolates from the Omega blend. As you can see, the Plantarum went a little bit uh, more acidic, but um, they kind of make up for each other. The uh, Brevis is a little bit lower pH, or you know, sort of its low end is the high end of the temperature range whereas plantarum is a little bit higher pH at, the, at that warm temperature. So it's got a little bit of flexibility, um, particularly if you don't have great uh, temperature control. Um, I personally, I don't think you have to worry too much about keeping the, the, P, the temperature right while kettle souring. Um, as long as you're pitching at 100, the thermal mass of the uh, wort will keep it warm enough. Um, and for something like the omega strain, it can actually be good to slow it down a little bit so you don't hit that 3.2 pH at two in the morning. You know, you give yourself a little bit more of a, a buffer to catch it at the right acidity. Um, this is uh, sort of an average of those three strains at those different temperatures over time. So you can see you get a really big drop uh, by about 18 hours and then it sort of uh, levels off a little bit. So you definitely have some time to catch the strain um, as it uh, drops. Um, so what is kettle souring good for? Um, if you want to, you know, have a beer that's ready to package, whether that's you know keg or um, bottle or you know, put in a growler pretty quick and not have to worry about you know contaminating your uh, you know uh, your beer gun or whatever. It's great. Um, you can add some you know have some sweetness in there and not worry about it too much. Some strains of lacto, of course, you know being that ferments you know milk uh, can ferment lacto, so I'd be a little hesitant on using. Um, live lacto if uh, you're looking to add lactose, but if you're kettle souring, lactose really isn't a, an issue at all if you want to have that, you know, milkshake sour sort of flavor. Um, in general, I think kettle sours are great for like really big flavors if you're doing lots of fruit, if you're dry hopping it, if you're, you know, doing a, a you know, real malty dark sour, something like that. Um, it needs something else just because lacto souring on its own is relatively bland. Lactobacillus really mostly makes lacto lactic acid, a tiny bit of ethanol, and not much else. Um, there are different strains that might, you know, might be a little more citrusy or a little more this or that, but it's a very minor character compared to Britannomyces and some of the other microbes we'll talk about. Um, you can do some whirlpool hopping after souring. Um, that's something I've done with good success. You know, kettle souring, heating up to 175 or 180 to pasteurize, adding a whirlpool addition then where you're not gonna get much bitterness. Um, bitter and sour sort of clash with each other. Um, and then doing your fermentation after that. So getting a kettle sour that has some um, you know, hop character, not just as a dry hop, but as uh, a kettle hop. I think it's good for sort of low to medium acidity. Um, if you go um, too sour, that's when you start having acid shock issues with the brewer's yeast. So what is acid shock? Um, so this is something that really came up first. Uh, first I heard about was a paper uh, Matt Bachman wrote. Uh, he was working with uh, Upland Brewing and they were having trouble bottle conditioning. They're really sour, uh, you know, bottle conditioned beers. And uh, what, what it turned out was happening was that they were just adding uh, brewer's yeast, you know, Cal Ale or something like that to the sour beer. And the, the pH was so low that that yeast was just going into a state of shock that it couldn't recover from. Um, and so there are a couple options there. Um, if you're, you're bottle conditioning, honestly, I'm a big fan of wine yeast or champagne yeast. It's more, you know, wine tends to be pretty low pH and high alcohol. Um, we just rehydrate it. We'll add a little, you know, yeast nutrient or something, and it tends to be fine. 
But if you're doing primary fermentation, either you need to find a strain that's acid uh, tolerant, um, or you have to you know, sort of worry about this. Um, so the yeast you know, takes some time to adapt to the low pH. They change the way their cell membrane works. And um, eventually, they can adapt and you know, uh, uh, ferment. Some cells don't make it, particularly if they're sort of you know, lower health cells. Um, if the pH is really, really low, you know, if you're down the low threes, that fermentation just may never take off. And even if it does, the finish of the fermentation may be a little sluggish, and you may end up with diacetyl or acetaldehyde, you know, sort of um, character you get from a, a poor finish to fermentation. Um, so at a minimum, I would suggest like a higher pitching rate, you know, even if you're doing a, a 5% kettle sour, you know, think of it like you're brewing a, a big, you know, a big barley wine almost, you know, maybe a, a lager of a similar gravity. Um, you know, I'd make a starter, um, I'd do extra aeration, you know, towards, towards the high end of the range. Um, after souring, I would add a, a nutrient of some sort, you know, maybe even something with some some nitrogen in it um, that you might not normally need in an all malt beer. Um, all that stuff really uh, helps. You know, if, if you're the sort of person who pitches dry yeast right into the fermenter, I might think about doing that rehydration rather than, um, you know, throwing it in there and it being at the mercy of not only um, osmotic pressure of the sugar, but also that low pH. Um, I did some tests a few years ago where I took the same sort of brown base wort. Um, I left some of it at this sort of, you know, normal kettle pH of 5.1, which is what it knocked out at. Um, I then add lactic acid to some to get down to three and a half, and then some to get just about down to three. Um, so this is sort of, you know, mimicking a moderate kettle sour and maybe a more extreme one. Um, as you can see, sort of on day two for California ale, um, you know, the attenuation was okay. It was a little bit slower at that lower pH. Um, but by day, uh, day six, it caught up. And honestly, if you look over those tasting notes, you know, tart, cocoa, estuary, a little fusel though, um, you know, not too bad. On the other hand, uh, once I got down to a pH of three, you know, the attenuation um, on day two was not much more than half of what it was for the other ones. Um, you know, it, it kind of caught up a little bit by day six, but even on day 11, when they were done, um, it was still 7% lower attenuation than the standard one. Um, and that really sort of mimicked whether it was uh, English ale yeast, you know, very similar again, way behind on day two, a little behind on day six, and then, you know, never caught up. And you can see those tasting notes over there to the right, you know, sour, rubber, aged out, diacetyl, um, just not exactly what you're hoping for. And even the Saison strain, you know, it wasn't quite as far behind on day two, but still at, on day 11 was 10% lower attenuation. Um, and again, you know, chemical and clove and sharp flavors, even with a warmer ferment. Um, so that's, that's all I'd say is that, you know, if you're really pushing that pH down, you might want to think about one of the other um, methods. Um, I didn't have a better place to put this, but this is sort of uh, Matt Bachman's uh, at, attempt to say, like, how you can acclimatize a yeast for lower pH. Um, and essentially, it's cram it full of nutrients uh, for 24 hours before, and then mix in some sour beer. Um, and so the idea there is sort of like tempering an egg if you were, if you were baking or cooking. Um, you mix in a little of that sour beer so that uh, the yeast gets a little taste of what, what's coming for it, but in a more dilute environment. So that um, low pH is being diluted by you know, the other liquids in the starter, um, and that's giving the yeast time in sort of a, a more mild environment to, you know, bundle up for the winter, as it were. Um, you know, it, it has, you know, for them, it's given them more reliable re-fermentations, but this is something you could consider if you have a strain that you really love for primary fermentation, and hey, if I get down to 3.1 or 3.2 pH, it's just not um, a vibrant, reliable fermentation, you might consider um, acclimatizing it in this way, and there's um, uh, Milk the Funk, the, the wiki has all sorts of great sort of um, step by step with exact amounts with more accessible, you know, the, the original one called for yeast extracts and peptones and um, you know, it's a lot easier when it's go firm and apple juice um, and apparently works just as well. Um, it's not something I've ever had to deal with much because again, I, I tend to do more uh, mixed ferment kind of stuff.
Um, we do a number of kettle sours, but they tend to be uh, honestly now because we're canning and that's something we can do. We just recently did one with uh, uh, mango puree and passion fruit juice. And we use a strain from uh, Berkeley yeast that produces a lot of the thiols that give that sort of passion fruity flavor. Um, but it's just sort of the kind of thing that's just like a bright, refreshing, fruit forward beer with a little bit of sweetness that a lot of people like drinking in the summer and we can put it in cans and we can charge sort of a more reasonable price than we have to when we do, you know, barrel aging and a long-term mixed ferments and bottle them and all, all that. Um, anybody have questions on kettle sour before I move on? I think we had uh, one that came in actually in the chat, Mike. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, this was from uh, Mark, and he said that uh, he's never brewed a sour beer, not even a kettle sour. So he wants to start a Solera next summer, but he's worried about his wild apartment temperature swings throughout the year, especially in the summer. So I don't know whether that applies to the kettle souring or not, but. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the nice things about kettle souring is sort of, you know, warm fermentation is not a big deal. Um, and then you can like any beer, you know, brew seasonally and select, you know, hey, it's warm in the summer, you can do a Kavik or you can do a Cezanne or whatever is the primary. Um, I'll talk about the sort of mixed ferment um, temperature control stuff, but I would say if you're planning to start a Solera next summer, I would really advocate starting to play around with wild microbes sooner than that. So I, I think one of the easiest things to do is get three or four, like four liter, they sell like the greens or jugs, or if you ever buy like, um, you know, gallon things of apple juice or whatever, you could use those. Um, and anytime you do a batch that is sort of uh, moderate alcohol, you know, five, six, 7% alcohol, you know, nothing's like super roasty or super bitter or super smoky. Um, you know, so it could be an English brown ale, it could be a Kolsch, it could be an American wheat ale, it could be, uh, a German lager, you know, most of those fit that category. I would divert, um, you know, four liters or a gallon or whatever sort of fits your, your size and add um, whatever yeast you were going to use anyway. And then you can top it up with a uh, commercial souring culture. There's so many great ones out there from um, Yeast Bay and Omega and Giga Yeast and Bootleg Biology. And, and you know, there, there's a dozen different yeast. I know. Escarpment, um, not too far from you guys, I believe. Um, and get that going and give it six months and then taste it. Um, because honestly, the most important thing for a great Solera, a great mixed fermentation is your culture. Um, and getting to taste um, those different microbes, you know, particularly if, with a similar ambient temperature um, is a great way to sort of get that started. And whether that's the start of your Solera or whether you're um, packaging at that point or blending or where, and then just repitching that yeast into the Solera. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about some warmer temperatures. Um, we try to keep our, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not great at Celsius. We, we're like 78, 77 degrees is sort of our summertime barrel warehouse. So I believe that's well, you know, 25, I think 20, is it like 24, 25? I'm, I'm, yeah, still, so, I'm still old school myself. So <laughs> yeah, so is it like, like warm, but not, you know, uh, hot, hot, if, if you can avoid it. Um, I, like a little bit cooler is probably better, but you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, if it gets above 62, that all of a sudden, um, you're really going to have trouble. Honestly, a lot of the real high temperature stuff, the bigger risk is if you have barrels because barrels, um, dry out and you get gaps in the wood and, and more evaporation because of the gap in the wood and then oxygen gets in and then you get acetic acid and ethyl acetate and all that stuff. If you're in a carboy, it's really not the end of the world. If you get up, um, you know, probably even at you know 27 or 28 Celsius, I wouldn't be too worried about, particularly if it's um, you know not constantly at that. You know, even if if your apartment gets a little warm during the day and then cools off at night, that beer um, it's a decent amount of um, thermal mass. It's not going to get all the way up to the room temperature if it then cools off at night. Nice, nice. Uh, we had we also had one other question sure. uh, coming through the chat uh, there, Michael and. Um, it was basically a, a pretty question. That I was a question that I I would mm -hmm. ask because I've never made a sour beer myself. But uh, uh, the question was from Max. He said, uh, "What's a great base beer style for a kettle sour?" So honestly, like most of the kettle sours we do, 
would look, other than not having hops, would look a lot like a pale ale. We often have some wheat, some oats, maybe some rye. Um, really with those, I'm, I'm often just trying to like layer in um, a little bit of body, a little bit of mouthfeel. Um, and really it's kind of taking a backseat to the fruit that then is being layered on it. Um, when you add a lot of fruit, that fruit has a lot of water in it, a lot of simple sugar. So you're really diluting out that protein content of the, um, the beer. Um, I'll talk a little bit in, the, in this section on like using hop acids and things like that. But um, for the most part, it's just sort of like a very low hop. Um, I don't really care for like toasty flavors in sour beers generally. I think that that's, they just sort of um, clash a little bit for me. Um, but I mean, I've done, I did a great uh, kettle sour porter that had, um, what was that? Like blackberries and plums or something like that. And so you can certainly do darker sours, red sours, pale sours. Um, honestly, if you're adding a lot of fruit, sort of the specifics of the grain bill probably aren't as important. Um, I am not fond, and I'll talk about in this section, of like Berliner Weiss and Goza as kettle sours. Um, if you're not adding anything else to them, I find that they just, they don't have a lot of malt, malt character. They don't have a lot of yeast character and without um, something else, they just tend to be a little bit bland. Um, if you're the sort of person who just likes a, you know, a glass of lemonade on a hot day, I think a you know, kettle sour Berliner Weiss can feel that same quenching but not particularly interesting sort of um, um, spot. I, I tend to like my Berliner Weiss is sort of like 3% lambics, you know, like a little bit funky, a little bit citrusy, a little bit doughy. Um, the sort of thing that if I had to, I could drink it cold and it would be refreshing. But really, I enjoy drinking them out of a, out of a tulip or out of a um, you know goblet, and really enjoying the sort of depth of the the souring and the fermentation and all that. Um, yeah, I mean, my blog has a, a lot of um, you know I I, I did some um, extract recipes, I did some you know all grain recipes. So there are a lot of them out there. Um, but you know, I mean, you can push them higher alcohol. You can you know. I think kettle sours are the way a lot of these breweries are doing the sort of smoothie sour kind of thing. You know, if you want, you know, fruit puree in suspension with vanilla or, you know, other dessert-like flavors, you're, you're sort of going to lose all the complexity of a mixed ferment or a barrel-aged beer behind all of that. And so I would tend to uh, look to kettle sour. Awesome. Sorry. So I think, I think that was, that, that was it for the, for the questions that are coming in from the chat. I don't know if anybody has any other questions for, uh, for Michael before he carries on. Uh, I have one quick question on kettle sure. souring. Um, in your brewery, are there, do you do any kettle sours where you don't pasteurize or boil after you reach your pH? You just, you throw in, you do kettle sour and just let it ride and, and then, you know, add fruit or, or whatever you're going to do after. Yeah. So that, that is actually exactly what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> All right. Good timing. Good transition. Yeah. Perfect. I'll, I'll just continue on. If anyone's got uh, more questions, there'll be another break in, in 10 or so minutes. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure this has sort of a great name, but I just call it quick mixed fermentation. Um, I think of mixed fermentation as anytime you have sort of two or more species of microbes uh, working at the same time. Um, so what we tend to do for our Berliner Weiss, a uh, little by slowly or a Goza Salzig, is that we will just sort of do a normal work production I tend to mash pretty cool, sort of on the, you know, the beta MOA side of the, um, the line. Um, and that's just because I'm trying to turn this beer around relatively quickly, you know, six weeks or something like that. And the more complex uh, starches and sugars and dextrins that are in the work, the longer I'm going to have to wait for it to stabilize. Um, we do a no boil sometimes for our Berliner Weiss. So we will mash, we'll knock out into the kettle, we'll bring it up to, um, you know, 70 C or so, um, sort of mash out kind of temperature, um, maybe a little bit higher than that. You don't want to go too hot because then you start producing DMS and it's a Pilsner malt word and you're not going to boil it. And the last thing you want is a, a beer that tastes like canned corn or tomato soup. Um, I tend to do that for the Berliner Weiss, but not the Goza. It leaves sort of like a fresh, raw, grainy, it's the sort of aroma you'll recognize from mashing in, you know, that sort of, um, oatmeal, for lack of a better, you know, cream of wheat, whatever you want to call it. Um, at that point, we will knock out in the fermenter at about 40 C, which is a real fast knockout for us through the heat exchanger, and just pitch lactobacillus. Um, and we'll let the lacto go for usually about 12 hours. So 
probably not all the way sour, but you know, hey, it really is working. It's getting the pH down. And then we drop the temperature down to whatever fermentation temperature we want. So if we're doing a, a sour uh, Saison, hey, we're not gonna cool it quite as much as if we're doing a, a Berliner Weiss or a Goza where uh, we, we usually just use USO5. Um, I find it reliable, it's clean. Um, it's what it gets done what I want it to get done. Uh, and we'll often pitch some Britannomyces at the same time. Um, so for a while we were working with a strain that uh, Christopher Pinchon is a French uh, sort of semi-pro microbe hunter had cultured out of a uh, 1992 bottle of Berliner Weiss from a brewery called uh, uh, Wilner Brewing, which I'd never heard of. Um, it was sort of a hit or miss Brett strain. Um, when it was on, it had this sort of like bright lemon poppy seed muffin kind of thing that was really fun, but a little too often it would give me more of like a, like a dill pickle kind of thing, which is not what I want in my Berliner. Um, so for the most recent batch of Argoza, we switched back to uh, the, um, the melange blend from the East Bay, which I like. It's sort of bright and lemony and has the good stuff I want without the sort of pickle aspect that I don't. Um, the nice thing about this method is that you sour a little bit more slowly because you tend to, you know, once once you get that temperature down, it's not the lacto is going to slow down too. Um, if it does get sour enough for your taste before fermentation is done, um, we just add a little hexalone or tetralone, so these reduced hop ex extracts. That that's te uh, tetralone is what was invented for uh, by Miller Brewing for uh, it's, you can't skunk it, so you can do clear bottles without worrying about um, you know, skunky flavors. Um, a small dose of dry hops also works. I mean, really tiny. Um, and we'll often do you know, uh, the equivalent of probably you know, five grams per gallon or, or maybe, no, I'm sorry, it's probably even less than that. It's probably one gram per gallon. Um, you don't need to isomerize hop, uh, hop compounds to um, stop lactobacillus. Low pH and hops really, uh, lacto is not gonna be happy. Um, I like it because it's super simple. You really don't have to, you know, like heat and cool and, and sour and moderate. And it's, it's a little, it's just easy. It's easier to deal with it, particularly if you're okay with it being as sour as it wants to be. And if it's a little more tart or a little less, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's lower energy because you're not pasteurizing. Uh, Post souring again. This is a beer we do called Atomic Apricot. Lacto sour in the tank and we uh, do 100% bread ferment, apricot puree, and then dry hop with citra and amarillo. Um, it's again, sort of you know, big bright flavors, um, but I, I really love it. So tips, again, I wouldn't do any hot side hopping. We brew for that lacto. And so the note there about um, lower pH, making hops more lethal to lacto. I've heard some brewers will say, oh, you know, I, I don't think I over hopped it because the beer started souring, it just didn't get as sour as I wanted it to be. Um, and I think a lot of that is often that there's, you know, seven or eight IBUs and the lactobacillus can handle that at, um, you know, a pH of four or 3.8. But once you get down to three, three, six or three, five, it, uh, it sort of kicks it in and activates that uh, lethality. Uh, so it, 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 if you really, um, Honing a recipe, this might be perfect because you could figure out that adding three IBUs stops the lactobacillus right where you want it, and that you know four IBUs is um, you know lets it you know doesn't want to get sour enough, and and one IBU it gets too sour. Um, but that's all you know really sort of a tricky and very fine line to deal with. Um, again, I'd advocate for making a little starter with your lacto, um, you know particularly if you're doing you know if you're getting it from a yogurt way or something else where you really want to get acclimated to uh, work, but even with the commercial cultures, just nice to know that it's alive before you pitch it in. Um, if you go too cool, you're really not going to be getting much souring after that initial souring. So if you um, cool down to, you know, 60, let's, let's say you want to do a sour lager and you pitch lacto and then you crash down to 54 for, you know, the pitcher lager yeast. I don't, you know, you're sort you're pretty much locking your, um, your, your sourness in. Um, one sort of trick that we learned the hard way um, when it comes to hops is if you're harvesting yeast from a beer that was reasonably hoppy, just the amount of hop bitterness in the, the, the trub and whatever else is mixed in with the yeast can be enough to inhibit the lactobacillus. So, um, you know, I generally suggest a fresh culture 
uh, dry yeast, um, a tube of you know liquid yeast that you've you've propped up as a starter or something like that. That is our goza salzig that we just did our third batch of. Um, what we do with this is that we um, ferment it for probably about two weeks and then we uh, keg it and we leave a little room in the kegs and we just sort of let it hang out. It generally drops a couple of points and carbs up pretty well, uh, but at worst we can always you know, put it on gas. Um, but it's really fun for us. Um, Britannomyces is under pressure to some of its most interesting work. And I think it's really fun for sort of the regulars that they can try it, you know, let's say four or five weeks old um, and it's bright and fresh and the Brett really hasn't started to come through. And then often it'll be on tap for, you know, three months or something like that. And every couple of weeks we tap a new keg that was stored warm and we'll pull it in and get cold before, but um, they'll get funkier and more interesting, a little bit drier and a little bit spritzier as time goes on. It uh, really makes for sort of a more unique interactive, um, you know, sort of uh, drinking experience. You can do the same thing at home if you're willing to bottle and, you know, keep those bottles somewhere where if they start getting overcarbonated, it won't be the end of the world. You know, make sure you're uh, putting one in the fridge every week or two and making sure that you're not seeing that carbonation build up. Uh, but again, mash and cool, using a really attenuative primary yeast, uh, you should be fine. The uh, general formula for carbonation works the same for Britannomyces, dropping uh, like one gravity point, so dropping 0 0.001 gets you about half a volume of CO2. Um, so it really doesn't take much to really add a, a good amount of extra carbonation. So again, be careful. Um, so what are these good for? Um, you probably do want to have dedicated equipment. Um, you don't need to worry about, you know, the kettle or the work chiller, or the mash tun or anything like that, but the stuff that the beer touches after you pitch. Um, what I used to do as a home brewer is I would just sort of hand down my equipment to my sour gear. So I had some uh, eight gallon wine buckets I used for fermentation for primary for a long time. After three or four years, they're starting to look all scratched up when I would, you know, put fruit beer in them or something, you'd start to see those lines and the scratches on the bottom. And so I said, hey, I'm gonna get some nice, you know, Spidel fermenters hand those buckets down the sour gear. Three or four years later, those Spidels were starting to look a little beat up. I got some SS Brewtech brew buckets. I threw out the old sour buckets. I made the Spidels my new sour gear. Um, so I think that's a really fun option. Um, you know, it, you know, I wouldn't use anything that was like, you know, broken or whatever, but you know, if tubing starting to look a little um, cloudy or your, um, you know, your uh, auto siphon is, is getting a little worse for wear it can become the sour thing. And so if you're thinking of, you know, making sour beer in a year from now, just start thinking about rather than throwing out something or, you know, making a good argument for maybe a spouse who doesn't want you to get new equipment and say, oh, you know, but I could, I could make some fun sour beers. Uh, you know, I just need to, you know, get some new fermenters for the clean beers. Um, it's a lot less risky for acid shock because you're co-fermenting. Again, I'm, I, I would say, you know, I tend to pitch the yeast when the pH is still at 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, something like that. Um, if you do take the pH all the way down and then pitch brewer's yeast, then you do have to be more uh, wary. Uh, we aerate, so we have um, you know, big cylinder conical, so we'll pump in oxygen through our carbonation stone um, right before we uh, pitch the brewer's yeast. Um, I think it's fun to pair this with 100% Britannomyces. So Britannomyces is the wild yeast that is probably most synonymous with sour beer, even though it does not make the beer sour. It makes all those sort of fruity, funky, earthy, barnyard, farmyard, pineapple, mango kind of aromatics you get in a great sour beer. Um, and so doing 100% bread, you're really pushing ester production and pairing those fruity aromatics with that acidity. Um, I think it's real fun. Um, Brett tends to be acid tolerant. Honestly, it's already a cross-contamination threat, so you don't have to worry about the lacto as much. Um, any questions on quick, quick mixed fermentations? Um, I mean, usually I do, you know, Saison, Berliner, Goza work well, but they, they can work well if you're doing um, a, a sour, you know, sour IPA or anything in that kind of, you know, realm. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. What, what ratio uh, between the two would you use? Uh, between Brett and Saccharomyces? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, we okay. tend to we tend to pitch. So uh, just as a, I'm, I I do sell counts for our clean beers. You know, when we're repitching or whatever. But we really it's sort of by volume on on things like this. So what I would do uh, is uh, so the lacto is probably one percent of the volume size, and then we're doing like a a standard or maybe even 150% of like a standard Saccharomyces pitch. And then my starter for the Brett is usually like 2% of the volume size. So it's a lot less Brett. Um, it's really just getting in there and it's gonna do its thing slowly over time. Um, you certainly could make a bigger starter or you could sort of grow it up. In all likeliness, uh, all likelihood, you're probably fine just pitching whatever if you're buying a commercial pitch. I would just add the commercial pitch of Brett as is. Um, I wouldn't worry about making a starter um, just as long as you've got enough uh, Saccharomyces to, to get the job done. If you're doing 100% Brett, you want to pitch that at a higher rate. I would make a starter in that case. Um, but for a co-ferment, the sack does its thing. And honestly, the beer is not going to taste very funky until it's been you know, three weeks, four weeks, um, particularly in, in package. Right, but like at a five gallon size, like would you really go with a full package of Brett? Well, so that's, that's a tricky question because uh, different yeast labs have very different amounts of Brett. So the white labs, and by extension, I believe most of the yeast-based stuff is very low cell count. Um, they are really, um, I can't remember exactly what the number is. I think a lot of those are in the like and maybe they did, I think they upped them a little bit, but they're in the like the 5 billion sort of cell range. So they're already maybe 5% of what the uh, brewer's yeast pitches are. Uh, the Y yeast and the bootleg biology, those tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, you certainly could pitch less of them, um, but I don't think there's much harm in pitching more. I was um, man, I'd take anything. I'm so excited. <laughs> When, uh, when you're talking about Brett in primary fermentation, it tends to not get funkier, it tends to get uh, more fruity. The more access it has to carbohydrates, the more esters it produces. And so that's why you generally see 100% Brett beers you know, push you know, cherry if it's Brett Lambicus or pineapple if it's uh, Brett Clausenii. Um, and so you certainly could pitch less, uh, but I wouldn't worry about pitching, you know, over pitching Brett or something like that. It tends to be a relatively slow fermenter uh, pitching more, it will honestly just sort of get its job going a little bit quicker. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I'll talk about uh, lactic yeast. Um, so this is actually like pretty much a whole new category of sour beer that really w didn't exist, uh, you know, even when I wrote the book seven years ago. Um, so I think probably I say at some point in the book that, you know, Yeast make alcohol, bacteria make lactic acidity. So, you know, usually in a sour beer, you have either lactobacillus, which is pretty quick and makes lactic acid, or pediococcus, which is a relatively close cousin of lacto, but it's a lot slower. It tends to ferment more complex carbohydrates and makes uh, as much, but often more lactic acid. Um, and then you have things like acetobacter, uh, vinegar producing uh, bacteria that need oxygen. But really, in general, you know, sort of uh, brewer's yeast or uh, Britannomyces can lower the pH a little bit. But if you get a pH really in the sour range, most of the time, bacteria is involved. Well, it turns out that there are quite a number of, of yeast out there that will produce lactic acid and ethanol. Um, and they are now reasonably widely available, although the... Um, Specifics on how to use them best are still kind of in a, a, a relatively juvenile state. Um, they're pretty hop tolerant, although I'll, I'll cover it a little bit. You know, they maybe are not as hop tolerant as a Saccharomyces or a Britannomyces. They tend to be a little um, slowed down by hops uh, in, in, you know, hop presence, but they are not stopped by them this, the way lacto would be. Um, so that allows you to do whirlpool hopping before souring if you're so inclined. Although, again, I'd suggest, you know, uh, cooling your whirlpool, you know, some, a lot of people we do on some of our juicy IPAs, um, you know, lower that whirlpool temperature, you can add more hops, more hop flavor without an overwhelming amount of uh, isomerization happening for those alpha acids. 
Uh, it's a single, you know, single microbe culture. So if you want to repitch it, it's a lot easier. If you try to do a co-ferment and harvest and repitch, the ratios of the microbes will switch around. And often if you repitch once or twice, it's not really going to change that much. But with long-term repitching, um, you're going to, you know, have some drift in one direction or another. Um, that said, um, they, uh, these microbes can be very sensitive to pitching rate. Um, and a higher pitching rate or a lower pitching rate often will cause them to not produce nearly as much lactic acidity. They tend to produce their lactic acid early on while they're growing and sort of starting the fermentation have access to simple sugars. And a really high pitch rate, they'll burn through that quickly and not do the same amount of uh, acidification. Uh, much lower risk of cross-contamination. If anything, these microbes tend to be like wimpier than Saccharomyces. Uh, we uh, have a uh, sour uh, IPA we did with uh, strata hops and a uh, new New Zealand variety called Nectaron that we're canning next week. And like three or four days into fermentation, it, it seemed like fermentation was stalling at about 20 or 25% at, uh, you know, warm temperature. And so we had to like really ramp up the temperature almost to, um, like you know, high 20s, 27, 28, to get it to um, like really kick along. And still it took, I think 10 or 11 days to reach uh, terminal. So it's quick, but maybe not quite as quick as kettle souring. Um, and, but honestly, I think it sort of excels at the same things that kettle sours do, you know, um, bigger flavors, you know, layering interesting flavors on top of them. It's not particularly interesting on its own. Um, when I've used it without a lot of hops or anything else, it tends to be a little bit cidery. Uh, many of these microbes have been found in lambics too. So what are we talking about specifically? The reason I call them lactic acid yeast is so I don't have to say Hanziospora, Lachancia, Schizosaccharomyces, Wickerhamomyces, or Zygosaccharomyces. Um, I'm sure there are others out there. Those are the ones that people are like currently marketing lactic acid yeast, two brewers under. Um, Lalamon is the, the biggest one, uh, but there's also Wild Pitch East Co. and Maniacal, and I'm sure there are others now uh, since since I uh, wrote this up a, a year or so ago. Yeah, actually, Michael, the uh, uh, the local, I say our local uh, yeast lab uh, uh, escarpment has produced something called Lactic Magic, which is a lactic yeast. Yeah, no, it's, it's super cool. It's It's actually sort of a contentious area, some of these labs and, and some university labs are uh, have attempted to patent the process of making a sour beer with name a particular uh, genus or species. Um, and so I haven't heard of anyone being sued yet, but there's um, some hesitancy from some yeast labs where you know there's there's always been some um, borrowing from one yeast lab to another. And I think uh, some labs have been, attempting to, you know, get ahead of it. And it's mm. a little tricky because a lot of these have been found in Lambic. So are you really, you know, you're not patenting the microbe, you're patenting the process. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I got a couple samples from uh, Wild Pitch Yeast, which is Matt Bachman, who I talked about earlier on the, um, the, the uh, acclimatization to souring. Uh, he has a little sort of side project where he does uh, a couple of these lactic acid yeast that he uh, isolated from his parents' backyard off of a couple of trees, um, you know, in Pennsylvania when he was out there. So these microbes really are just out there in the world. Uh, so I did a four-way split. I did, um, you know, one each fermented uh, the base beer with just like five IBUs and then sort of a whirlpool hopped hoppy version. Um, and you can say, see there even five days in, this just started at, you know, 13 Play-Doh. So was that 1056? Um, and it was still at like, you know, 1040 for the hoppy ones, uh, five days into fermentation with a super fresh pitch. Um, that is, would really worry me if it, it had been more than, you know, four gallons or whatever. Um, the base one without all the hops was a little bit quicker, but even five days in still wasn't really even 50%. Um, they all finished eventually, uh, but, you know, like, you know, three weeks, four weeks, something like that. So it was not a super um, user-friendly experience, at least in that case. I mean, again, maybe I, I didn't even sort of write in here what, you know, maybe I wasn't fermenting warm enough. Maybe there are a variety of things that could have happened. Um, but in both cases, you know, the pH has ended up similar, you know, sort of the, 
honestly, right, right around where I like him, you know, three, 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 four, three, five, you know, tart, bright. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, quicker than a mixed fermentation. It's a little bit slower than a, a kettle sour. So there's certainly, you know, that's what I got for those two. Um, and that's really sort of the message here is this is still very much an early phase. You know, talk to your yeast lab, talk to, you know, read the instructions for the yeast because it may be surprising. Um, with Philly sour, adding simple sugars is supposed to uh, bump up lactic acid production. So at least you have some levers to pull, um, but they're now apparently revising their recommendations, pushing it warmer and warmer for fermentation. Um, so it's, it's uh, sort of interesting. It's an exciting area of study. Um, a lot of the same kind of things as a kettle sour, you know, if you're planning on packaging this and having it be shelf stable for a long time, if you're sharing equipment with your clean beers, um, again, I think, you know, sort of big fruit or big hop additions or malt or something, it really helps to carry these through. Um, but again, those are the three I've tried. Um, and, and what Escarpment has or what somebody else has may make some interesting esters or may make a more um, uh, pleasing product than the ones I've tried that just did, you know, ethanol, acidity, and maybe a little bit of cidery thing. Um, again, you can roll pull hop before souring. Um, most of your sort of acidity control is going to be strain selection. So in the case of Lalaman, uh, Philly sour, you know, sort of like tart, but not super sour. Um, ours got down to about 3.3, three, but once we're dry hopping, it'll raise it back up. They also make a, they call it Sour Vissier. It's a genetically modified um, clean Saccharomyces strain that they've added a lactic acid gene to. So I, I'm not uh, particularly averse to uh, GM stuff, but I know a lot of people are. Those are the resulting beers. You can see sort of like really nice head retention, um, unlike some, you know, kettle sours and some mixed ferments. Any questions on lactic acid yeast? I'm, I'm by no means an expert on them, but I've, you know, brewed a few batches and honestly, somebody from Escarpment would probably be able to talk better about their strain, which I haven't used. Yeah, we should uh, give a shout out there to, to Emily and, and Escarpment. Um, so if you're interested in lactic acid yeast, I mean, there's definitely, it's a, it's lactic magic is available. Uh, I, I believe currently Emily uh, in the stores, I'm not sure, right, but. Uh, yeah, it should be in the store. Um, I don't know if it's back ordered, but. Cool. Yeah, and honestly, as a professional brewer, like it's, it's so great that home brewers have the time to deal with this stuff. Uh, the guy from Sweet Generous uh, did a lot of stuff on Philly Sour that was really terrific for us on um, you know, pitching rates and on temperatures and, and all those sorts of things that often bigger yeast labs really don't give you a lot of um, direction or, or a lot, of, you know, just don't have a lot of specificity on, on what works and what doesn't. And um, sort of the I guess uh, the Lachancia that's in Philly Sour is a lot smaller than uh, Brewer's Yeast. And so if you're just repitching by volume, you might be pitching a lot more cells and that might then throw off the uh, acidification. So again, it's, it's an area that's fascinating and um, very much worth jumping into if you, um, like most home brewers, would rather pitch a yeast and wait an extra week rather than have to deal with monitoring a kettle sour or dealing with a mixed fermentation or something like that. It's a great way to make just sort of a bright, fresh, you know, summer uh, quenching tart beer. Okay. Um, so this is really just sort of the long-term mixed fermentation and, and you can do that in barrels. You can certainly do that in carboys. Um, personally, I don't love buckets. Um, the plastic itself is a little bit more uh, permeable to oxygen but not so much that it really is a big issue. The, the main problem with buckets is that if that lid isn't seated exactly, you know, particularly if you have a, a bucket that doesn't have a gasket in there and just sort of a snap-on lid, um, it's very easy to have that, that uh, lid off just a little bit. And that's not a big deal for a primary fermentation, but if you're leaving a beer alone for six months and it's got that constant little stream of oxygen from the air in, um, you're going to end up with malt vinegar or nail polish remover or something else you don't want. Uh, 
Tags can certainly work if you've got an easy way to, to vent off excess pressure. Um, I used a lot of plastic carboys at home with you know, just sort of a normal stopper and airlock. Um, just make sure those airlocks stay uh, topped up, um, particularly right after a big temperature change. You, know, you can suck back in if it gets colder or um, evaporate off or bubble off. Um, but generally, my approach to barrel aging is to create as much intentional variability as possible. Um, you don't want to have six carboys with the exact same wort and the exact same microbes because then you really don't probably have many options. There's a chance that one of them gets a little bit more acidic or a little less, you know, but I'd much rather, uh, as a home brewer, you know, rather than having one 60 gallon barrel with one culture in it, having 12, you know, five gallon, um, you know, carboys going with different microbes or different oak or different, different everything. Um, you know, some of them in a little warmer spot, some in a little cooler spot. And that way, when it comes time to blend, and we'll talk about that, um, you have some options. You have some, this is too sour, this isn't sour enough, great, I can blend them. Uh, this isn't sour enough, maybe it'll be great on sour cherries or blackberries. This one's too sour, maybe a little vanilla, maybe a little dry hop uh, might, might help to bring it around. Um, and that's really so much of what I think my skill goes to at, at Sapwood is, um, coming up with things to start and then picking up the pieces when my plan totally falls apart. Um, we started with um, basically every single barrel had a different culture in it. Um, we got commercial microbes from every you know, lab we could think of. Um, but then we also used you know, bottle drags from really cool sour beer producers just to add uh, diversity. Uh, we've done you know, wild captures to get you know, local microbes in there. And now, sort of as we're approaching the third anniversary of our barrel program, more and more we find ourselves, um, like last week we were doing a, a pale sour with aged hops and unmalted wheat and, and whatever. And I went to the barrel cellar while Ken, our, our brewer, was brewing and tasted a bunch of barrels, brought samples out to Scott. We discussed which, you know, which one we liked more. I kegged off five gallons of the uh, you know, barrel we really liked, and we used that as sort of the microbe starter for uh, the new batch. Um, and that really has gotten us more consistent results and it's starting to hone in on a house flavor, but without having to commit to a single house culture. So those microbes will go into that main batch, that will then go into barrels, and each of those barrels will probably have a slightly different uh, micro profile. Some of them are reused, some of them might get some, some additional bottle dregs. And then, you know, it's sort of like seed saving. Every year we're going to get maybe a, hopefully a little bit closer to that ideal culture. Um, to the, you know, the microbes that sour enough for us that, you know, ferment as quickly as we want them to, that get the type of funky aroma, you know, the, the lemon, the mineral, the, that we're looking for, maybe not the obnoxious, you know, over the top, um, funky, smoky kind of things that we don't want. Um, you know, you can use all sorts of different base beers, you can, you know, vary aging conditions, all that stuff. This is a photo from uh, Gabe at Anchorage Brewing up in Alaska. And when he first opened, he uh, cut a hole in the top of a couple of barrels, filled them with wort and drew, drove them out into the wilderness and right by some moose that were in the, out there and, and you know, started a wild ferment. Uh, it was really funny. I was talking to him about my first wild ferment. I was like, yeah, like, you know, you know, three or four months in, it had this, it was like a tropical hefeweizen. in it. It was like a little bit, um, you know, pepper clove, but then it had this great like mango or like passion fruit. He's like, yeah, that's exactly how these barrels were three months in. And that totally went away. And then the same thing happened to me. Uh, and I live in Washington, DC. So, you know, 4,500 miles or you know, 10,000 10, kilometers, whatever it is away from Alaska. And, um, you know, that's just the way, you know, these wild microbes uh, worked for both of us by chance. Uh, there's a selection of microbes that I, um, had when I was starting out the barrel program at Modern Times in San Diego. Um, you know, a couple of those, you know, the Yeast Bay, this was pre-production for them. So it was just one of Nick's, you know, test breaths. Uh, East Coast Yeast I love, um, you know, some, some homebrew kind of, um, you know, microbes that were captured. And we did a very similar thing out there, sort of starting with as many things as we could. Um, I heard you guys have barrels, so I, I won't, you know, harp on it too much, but I think as someone said, like getting a high quality barrel, if you're going to put that much time and effort and, and um, you know, personal, uh, you know, so much of yourself into a beer, 
wait for a really good barrel. Um, you, know, uh, you know, if it's a wine barrel, hopefully one that's uh, you know, freshly emptied that has, you know, no issues with it. Um, spirit barrels tend to hold up a little bit better, but still, you know, they'll dry out, they have gaps. Um, it's more hassle than it's worth dealing with sort of an old barrel. Um, what we do is we uh, have sort of always beer that's ready to go, so like beer that has a base culture in it. We use a lot of uh, flex tanks, which are just big winemaking plastic tanks. They're sort of totes um, or a stainless fermenter or in kegs or whatever. And so when it's time for barrels or when we, we get a call from a local winery that says, hey, we're emptying some great white wine barrels and we can't refill them. If you guys want them, grab them later today. We don't then have to order grain, schedule the brew, find the yeast, make the, you know, it's like we're ready to go, we're ready to fill. Or similarly, and, and more so now, uh, hey, uh, you know, we, we're done tomorrow, we're bottling a raspberry, blueberry, vanilla, bourbon barrel aged pale sour. Cool. The next beer goes in, it will be ready to go into the, uh, the blending tank for packaging. And at that point, we'll have to refill those barrels that were empty and we've got beer ready to go. We've got a, uh, a wit that we soured. And that'll be like a really fun, weird thing that probably wouldn't have planned on doing, but like that's what's ready to go and we're ready to, to you know, refill those barrels rather than dealing with you know, holding on to empty barrels and dealing with um, you know, vinegar production or mold or whatever. We'd rather just get them refilled as, as quickly as possible. Uh, that was a tip I got from Vin Chalurzo at Russian River, who wrote the forward for my book. He said, hey, on our, you know, our, our first batch of uh, uh, supplication, our sour cherry brown, we empty the barrels, and then I wait until the next morning to refill them, and I will never do that again because they, a bunch of them went vinegary and, you know, live and learn. Um, and with sour beer, the cycle is so long, you know, a year, two years, that you really try to be as conservative as you can. Uh, because you don't want to spend all that time waiting for a beer that then is not going to taste great. Um, so we purge everything with CO2 before filling. Um, we have extra beer around for topping up. So usually around six months, I'll top up the barrel and they'll do it again after another six months or after a year of aging, unless we're getting close to wanting to package it or put it under fruit or something like that. Um, and you can see there, my ideal temperature is 16 to 27. A little bit warmer, particularly for part of the day, isn't the end of the world. But you know, I wouldn't put them in a, a shed behind your house that was um, 35 all summer or something like that. Uh, that's a, a flex tank. They do make them in sort of smaller sizes. You know, they they make. We've got some 80 gallon ones we use for uh, adding fruit to a single oak barrel um, that you know are not crazy sized. If you want to do a you know collab of some sort with a a bunch of home brewers in one. Um, as a home brewer, uh, I. I, my friend uh, Nathan Zender and I, uh, he was the head brewer for a long time at Right Proper Brewing and now runs a winery called the Hibernaculum where he does cider wine, hybrids, all sorts of crazy, amazing stuff. Um, had a couple of barrels at his house where we would have a couple of friends get together. Everybody brews some work, ferments it, refills the sour barrel. Everyone works together to package, you know, all, all the beer that comes out of it. Uh, we tried to do a clean barrel once and then never again. Um, You've got to have a lot of brewers you really trust that one of you hasn't introduced some microbe that shouldn't be in there when it comes to a, a collaborative clean beer. Uh, we uh, had to institute a uh, taste test. And, you know, there'd be thing, you know, someone would use uh, special aroma and says special B and their beer would be a different color and would have to go, I guess it's fine. It's just getting diluted. Uh, there's our pallet stacker that we use for moving the barrels around. This is uh, where all the barrels used to be. They're now in a new um, dedicated facility and that's all filling up with bourbon barrel aged stouts and barley wines and that kind of stuff. Uh, well, probably less interesting to home brewers, but you know, have some way of tracking it. it. It always mystifies me when people say, oh, you know, I found this, you know, carboy and I don't know what it is. You know, mark your carboys, mark your barrels, you know, put the notes somewhere in, in Beersmith. We use uh, Google Sheets a lot just because we can all edit it at the same time and it's you know, automatically backed up and all that. Uh, we put uh, sort of the basic information on the barrel, um, you know, what the beer is, when it was filled, any notes, hey, this really needs a, another dose of microbes, it wasn't tasting great or whatever. Um, and that's sort of a look at our spreadsheet that you know, we uh, track what, what goes in, when it gets filled, when it gets emptied, what release it ended up in, you know, notes, any of that stuff. Um, 
it's a lot harder to rely on your memory when you're dealing with these long age sours. You know, for a, a pale ale, it's pretty easy to remember, you know, what you fermented at or the temperature or what hops you used over the course of a couple of weeks. Uh, with sour beers, you're often, you know, it's sitting there for a year and you may not remember exactly, you know, why you did something or what you did and you want to be able to learn from that. Um, when it comes to blending and packaging, my general approach is if I really love a beer, I leave it alone. I don't try to gild the lily. I don't try to add fruit to the perfect beer. Um, you know, I love more than anything, you know, barrel microbes, um, that interaction. But that's sort of part of running a, a blending program is that not every barrel is perfect. And honestly, um, currently the way things are, people love, you know, fruited sours that are more interested in those than, um, you know, a straight, you know, a, one of my favorite beers we've done was Stallion Cover. It was a uh, blend of uh, stainless steel Saison and like a year old barrel aged wine barrel sour. And it's a little bit funky. It's a little bit tart. It's, it's subtle. It, it has layers of flavor. It's moderate alcohol. Uh, and it, you know, it's selling it probably, you know, a quarter of the rate of, you know, a big intensely fruited, more wow kind of beer. Um, Personally, I wouldn't sort of throw fruit at bad beer if it's vinegary or nail polishy or mold, you know, anything that's really offensive, um, dump it, it's not worth it. Um, but again, you know, if it's a little low on acidity, but it's bland, hey, fruit. It's a little high on acidity, dry hopping raises the pH. Um, so that could be a big help too. Um, we've done a couple, we've done a mosaic hop saison um, blend that was called prosaic that I really liked. We do, so for packaging, and you could sort of replicate this at home a little bit. Um, we pre-carbonate the beer to like one and a half to two volumes of CO2. It just, it's enough that we can actually measure it on our, our ZOM. Um, and then we prime and, um, and toss in some yeast. We then use a counter pressure filler. Uh, you do something similar if you have a keg and a, and a beer gun, you know, um, you know, hook it up to gas for a little while, push in a little sugar and yeast if you want to, or as a home brewer, I just would, you know, put in a bottling bucket, you know, stir in the sugar, stir in the yeast. Um, usually that would give me a little THP. So uh, tetrahydropyridine is, um, once you know what the flavor is, you'll start seeing it in a lot of beers. Um, I generally describe it as sort of like a weedy Cheerio thing. It tends to be in the finish. Uh, when you breathe out, so that retro olfactory after you take a sip, it's just this lingering sort of multi weirdness. Um, people don't, who at really high levels, it can get sort of mousy, like mouse urine, um, just sort of like a really sort of off funkiness. Um, but honestly, like we've had a couple of um, blending days where people will come in and people, a lot of people like that flavor. Um, as one of those classic, like what's an off flavor? What is a, uh, you know, what's a feature? You know, the, some people say the green bottle skunkiness of a Saison is like part of the style and an enjoyable thing at the right level. And other people say, hey, it's an off flavor. I never want to taste it. Uh, this is uh, our, this is Scott and our uh, old assistant Warren, who's now a head brewer in a brewery in Annapolis called Forward Beer, uh, using, I think it was probably our first batch. So each of those fills takes about a minute. Um, we use fast racks and we spray a little uh, sandy clean in the bottles just to, to make sure there's nothing in there. And we just bottle four bottles a minute, you know, hundred, what is that? 240 bottles an hour. And, and a lot of our runs are, you know, a thousand uh, bottles. So, you know, between setup and kegging and bottling and cleanup, it's most of a day for uh, two or three people. Um, I mean, sour beer, you can do fruit, obviously. Honey is really fun. This is one we did with uh, bee, uh, honey from a local apiary, wildflower, and then we got beeswax wax from the same, uh, the same hives to uh, dip the bottles in, and I made a heck of a mess. So when it comes to blending, again, you know, sort of as a, as a home brewer, you probably won't have as many blending options, although I, I know home brewers who have 35 or 40 carboys going at, at any one time, um, but, you know, Take, you know, figure out which beers are ready at the same time, you know, taste them all, you know, really, um, you know, toss any that are off or unpleasant. It's not worth trying to sort of, you know, sneak a little extra beer in if those microbes are going to go to work in the bottle and cause trouble. Um, you know, think about what your goals are. Um, are you trying to add a city to something? Are you trying to dilute something out? Are you trying to 
hit a particular volume for a party, you know, whatever it is, you know, figure out what your goal is. Um, you know, start out with maybe equal ratios, then back them up and down as you need. Um, I like using a little gram scale, you know, you can make a hundred gram blend and that's just easy for percentages and you don't have to mess around with convert, converting after that, you know, 50 grams of this, 25 grams of that, 25 grams of that. I'd suggest starting fresh with each blend. So after you take two sips, don't then try to doctor it because at that point, the ratio is really hard to deal with. Unless again, you're deal, doing it on a scale. So think about, you know, adjusting acidity, balancing out a, a one flavor with another, you know, building in a little complexity. You know, are you starting with a beer that's really uh, distinct character and then trying to build around that? Or are you just trying to, you know, dilute down the acidity before adding fruit? Uh, when it comes to fruiting, for barrel-aged sours, I mean, it's sort of like a connoisseur's kind of product. And I really like using local seasonal fruit whenever it's available. That said, we'll sometimes um, buy, buy fruit and freeze it if a beer is not quite ready yet or just help break down the cell walls. Um, I love foraging. Uh, we did a beer last summer with a local restaurant where we picked uh, wine berries, which are a cousin of like blackberries and raspberries. It's an invasive species in the US that was uh, uh, brought here, I think, in the 1800s. Um, they taste like little jelly donuts, but they are tiny. And it took us uh, like 10 people five hours to pick that many of them. That's a uh, five gallon bucket. Um, purees and juices and concentrates can work, particularly if you're dealing with, you know, um, tropical fruits that are not available locally. Um, and certainly, you know, makes a lot more sense if you're doing a kettle sour and you want something that's uh, aseptic going in rather than, you know, whatever's living on, um, uh, local fruit. Um, generally for sour beers, like there's nothing worse on local fruit or more dangerous to the beer than uh, what you've already added. You've, you've added most of the prime spoilers already. Um, ideally, you want to put all the fruit with all the beer you're going to blend rather than sort of like a concentrated amount. You'll just get better extraction and better flavor. Um, we reuse with wine yeast generally when we're adding fruit just to help ferment it out. Um, Commercial breweries doing these sort of pastry sours, smoothie sours, tend to be sterile filtering onto aseptic um, fruit products. As a home brewer, as long as you're keeping the beer cold in a keg, you can definitely get away with, you know, um, putting some fruit juice or fruit puree into a keg and jumping beer on top of it and keeping it cold. It's also just as viable to, you know, dose into the glass as you drink, you know, a fruit juice or uh, a flavor of your choice. And there's the finished beer, Invasive Species. It was aged in some local uh, natural red wine barrels that were real real punchy and fruity, really went well with the, uh, the wine berries. That's actually that's the only photo I have in here of our new space, but you can see our logo floating up there in the background and uh, uh, Scott's nice paint job. And there's my book, American Sour Beer. Uh, if you don't have a copy, it's on Amazon and wherever else. Uh, it's seven years old, but honestly, it's still like, they're, I wouldn't say there's much wrong in it, um, but there certainly are things I'd love to eventually add. Um, we haven't really talked about a second edition yet. Brewer's publication usually tries to do 10 years before sort of cannibalizing their own market on something. But there's my contact info. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit and answer questions. I, this was all sour beer. And so if you want to hear about IPAs or um, you know, starting a brewery or whatever, uh, I'm happy to talk about it, but if you would rather not ask your embarrassing fermentation question uh, in front of all your fellow home brewers, um, shoot me an email. I, uh, as David can attest, I'm not real good at answering emails uh, compared to when I sat at a desk for eight hours a day and needed to goof around on my phone once in a while. Uh, today, a local distiller showed up like four hours after emailing me and said, hey, I'm just stopping by. And I, after he left, I was like, oh, he emailed me hours ago. Um, I, I just, uh, am running around basically all day, every day and, uh, don't look at my phone. <laughs> uh, but no, th thank you for saying all through this. I'm, I'm sure this was, um, uh, interesting to some of you and a, a curiosity for, for others. So happy to answer questions. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Michael. That was, uh, that was really, really interesting. And you covered like the gamut, I would say, like, I, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a sour beer I've never made one. I'm not, I'm not, I usually don't drink them, but I do get offered them uh, uh, from time to time and I, I never refuse them. 
And it's always interesting to see what goes into them, especially when it comes to things like mixed fermentations and, and barrel aging and stuff like that. So um, does anybody have any questions for Michael? Uh, like, let's, let's open the floor. I mean, uh, it's, it's rare we get a chance to uh, have a, have a open chat like this. So. Someone, if you don't you mind go. Just Everyone me hopping in. There you go, Max. Go ahead. Hey, Michael. Thanks for that. Um, I was wondering about uh, actually like blending different sours and trying to, what do you aim for when you do that? What uh, are like good sides and bad sides? Sure. So the, the trickiest thing is um, if you're using two different base beers and two different cultures, having any confidence that the microbes in one that are more aggressive aren't going to start going after the sugars in the other. Um, so usually when we're blending, we're blending beer that started as the same wort, and then you have, it's relatively easy to calculate, oh, if we blend a sweeter one into that uh, drier one, and we assume that the gravity goes down to the same, we'll get an extra half a volume of CO2, so we'll aim a little on the low end, and if we get that little extra, we won't be too bad. Uh, that gets a lot trickier when you're blending two different words that have different fermentabilities and two different blends of, of microbes. In those cases, you're probably better off blending together into a carboy and letting them sit for say a month and testing the gravity again and making sure it's stable before uh, packaging. Um, generally when I'm blending, so <laughs> early on I would say we were tasting through barrels and picking the barrel that tasted good uh, and then trying to pick another barrel that might complement it, that, you know, might, um, you know, add a little bit if the acidity wasn't high enough, you know, finding a barrel with a little bit more sourness that would um, give that beer that had great aroma, a little bit more sour uh, oomph. Um, now, a lot more of our barrels are tasting better and we're using, um, the same uh, culture for a whole batch and then sort of has a little, um, you know, up or down. Um, so for example, we just did a blend of sour reds from red wine barrels and bourbon barrels that had, uh, that we had uh, cherries to. And for that one, um, we were, we liked one of the, we had two bourbon barrels that were sort of available and we liked one on its own a lot more than the other. The blends were pretty close, but the one we really liked was more acidic and going on to cherries that sour cherries have a lot of malic acid. We didn't want to overdo the sourness. And so we decided to use the barrel that was okay, but maybe a little less exciting in the blend because it was going on the cherries and to take that barrel that we really liked that was a first use Heaven Hill bourbon barrel. And we haven't figured out what to do with it, but we're going to do something with that one on its own. So we'll probably, we may ball that one straight up and just have it be a single barrel without cherries sort of um, uh, complement to the cherry, you know, the bigger batch with cherries, or maybe we'll uh, pick a different, more interesting fruit or something like that. Um, so I, I, to me, the easiest thing when you're blending is to get a couple of people together. Um, I used to do that. I would have, you know, four or five sours are all right around the same time. I'd, I'd call a couple of friends and say, hey, if you want to come over and help me taste these beers, um, and hey, if you want to help me package them, we can do a little blend for you. And so um, you know, each of my friends would come up with a blend and we'd do maybe say a two gallon uh, bottling run for each of them. And I'd keep half of their blend. They'd get half of their blend. Um, they'd help you know, me do a bigger blend for myself and maybe bottle off the rest of them unblended. Um, and that was just like a really fun way to like get them involved, get some other palettes, you know, be able to talk something over with someone. Um, I view blending a lot like I, do, I, I uh, view um, judging beer. You know, you have to know where your weak spots are. If you are someone who doesn't taste diacetyl really well uh, or uh, doesn't think any beer could be sour enough, it's really valuable to have someone else there that you taste it, you don't say anything, you both kind of make some notes and say, oh, what'd you think of this? Or, hey, what, you know, what'd you think of this city on that one? Hey, try this blend I just came up with. I really think it pushes this or that. Um, because in the end, that's the most important thing is how it tastes. Um, we don't tend to blend like with a pH meter in our hands. It's more about tasting it and seeing if it tastes too acidic um, to us because different acids, different um, base beers are going to express acidity in different ways. Thank you. That's, that's really fascinating and 
you know, maybe has the interesting idea to get a bunch of people together and do that. Yeah, cool. what, Appreciate one, it. one of my good buddies, uh, and he sort of was taking the idea and really run with it. He's got a whole bunch of carboys of, of his own, but he'll say, hey, if you've got a Saison or you've got homemade wine or you made a, a cherry mead, bring it. And then we'll sit around and we'll go, oh, we'll, you know, so-and-so's red wine into this blend with the cherries from, the, you know, uh, it makes a much more sort of dynamic kind of thing. Um, I used to do some uh, workshops for Brewer on Magazine. That was always fun. I would um, just buy some like, you know, Goza or some Berliner Weiss, wherever we were. And then I would buy some mead. I would buy some herbal wine, some vermouth or something. I'd get some fruit juice and some beet juice and just sort of set people to work, you know, blending things and trying things and all of this and all of that. And um, it's, a, it's a fun way to spend an afternoon if, you know, everybody brings a couple of bottles of sour beer and, and one or two, you know, fun things to add. Cool. I think, I think uh, Daryl, you got your hand up. Uh, what do you got to say? Hey, Mike, uh, great presentation, first of all. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you had any techniques to so say, like, I'm blending out of like carboys and it's always the thing of like when you're doing blends, like breaking the pellicle, right? So I'm usually using like a wine teeth or whatever, but if I'm doing like several different carboys, do you have any techniques for like, if I'm having to dip in there like a few times into the same carboy, like would I usually recommend like flushing with CO2 after, or does it just kind of naturally take care of itself or just any methods that you might recommend? Yeah. Um, so as uh, with our barrels, we have the old stainless steel nail trick. So we have stainless steel nails through the heads. We pull those to get samples, but honestly it pulls the vacuum pretty quick. And we just sort of um, like, uh, like take off the bung a little bit and a little air gets in and it's never caused trouble for us. We are having to take the bung off and, and stick your, your sample thief down in there like purging with a little bit of CO2 wouldn't be a bad idea, I would say. Um, I'm not a big believer that the pellicle is super integral to the whole thing. Um, as, a, as, as a brewery with barrels, anytime we have to get a barrel out of a stack, we're moving the whole stack around, we're pulling barrels off, we're restacking, those pellicles get knocked down. If that um, yeast is still working, it's going to reform that pellicle if it wants, and if it's done, then hey, it's done. Um, the uh, pellicle generally forms in response to oxygen in the headspace, you generally won't see very much of a pellicle if there isn't some oxygen in there. Um, and so if you're getting like really thick pellicles, I would, I would look at, you know, making sure your airlock is, you know, full and that the, the bung, you know, the, the, the rubber is, you know, really well seated. Um, and you're always going to have a little bit, you know, sort of a spidery, wispy kind of cover. But if it's getting really thick, I, I, it would be more of a, a reason to concern me than anything else. Um, so yeah, I mean, sticking, sticking the, the um, sample thief in there. If you're trying to pull like bigger samples, um, using a auto siphon or something, you know, get out, you know, a pint at a time, rather than having to go back and forth, um, might be a, a, a good way to go. Um, there's a lot of sort of thought either way on, you know, how well you want to clean your sample thief in between. There's a, a niceness. I've definitely been to breweries where they just kind of pull samples kind of willy nilly and just sort of say, hey, it's the house culture. And if it moves from one barrel to another, you know, the more the merrier. Um, and there are some breweries who, you know, even within the same um, place, you know, hey, we have different microbes that go in the strong dark sour that go in the light pale sour. We want to keep them separate if we can. Um, I mean, the, the bigger you get, the harder any of that is. And as a home brewer, I'd rather try to keep them separate, you know, that you don't have some microbes that get into all of them that, you know, has uh, some weird flavor to it. Great, I think it's uh, answered Daryl's question. Anybody else have any questions for Michael? Uh, Bill here, I have a couple of questions. Thanks sure. Mike for doing this. Uh, it's a two part question. Uh, one part, I don't know if you mentioned it during this, but it's sort of an ingredient I wanted your uh, idea how to use like uh, orange zest. I, I think you mentioned using it at one point. So just curious if you can dry hop with it, if you can probably put it at the end of the boil. So that's the first question. The second question, I noticed there's a carboy there behind you. I'm curious what's in that. Uh, the, the easier question is, uh, I brewed a 100% chit malt. So chit malt is undermodified, like German Pilsner malt. Uh, we use it a lot in our sour beers for head retention. We use it for hoppy beers, all sorts of things. And 
like two and a half years ago, I thought brewery 100% chip malt stays on and it's still sitting there. Uh, it shouldn't be, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And it's more of a decor item now. Um, orange zest though, um, depends on what you're trying to get. So uh, when we do our wit, we use dried orange peel, a blend of sweet and bitter. Uh, in the Whirlpool, it does not make a particularly citrusy beer, but it just sort of adds some wit flavor, for lack of a better phrase, along with coriander and chamomile. Um, it doesn't make, you know, if you really want to make an orange wheat beer, it's not going to get the job done for you. It's, it's a subtle, I mean, the old, the old Belgian, uh, you know, if you can identify the spice you've used too much um, for, so we do a lot of our, we do a lot of citrus zest in general. Um, we do uh, vanilla, citrus zest, IPAs and double IPAs, we call sorbets. Um, and then we've used it a bunch in sour beers. Um, honestly, using it, um, so we tend to zest it. We have a thing called a rotato that you put the citrus zest on. It's like a potato peeler that takes off a long strip of the zest. Um, that does a pretty good job. It takes some pith off with it. Um, my personal feeling, uh, if, if I had the effort for it as a home brewer, um, I use a vegetable peeler. So I'll take off long strips from whatever the citrus is. I'll flip it over and then I'll use a knife and I'll scrape off the, um, the pith. So you end up with just a, a beautiful strip of zest without the white on the back. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of um, microplaners, uh, the, the zesters. I love them for garlic or if I'm you know, putting a little citrus on some fish or something fine. Um, I think you're volatizing a lot of the oils that you, know, you almost see that spray of oil when you use them. Um, I think that, I think maybe they don't get down quite deep enough. Um, so I like those sort of like nice, long, big whole strips of zest. Um, we do, I would have to look at the math, but I mean, it's probably only the equivalent of three maybe oranges uh, or grapefruits or something like that in a five gallon batch. So, you know, you know, one, one, one or two per 10 liters, um, not a huge amount. Um, and generally post-fermentation, they have a lot of alcohol soluble flavors. So, you know, double IPAs extract a lot better than pale ales, that kind of thing. Um, I'll usually dunk the citrus in sort of a dilute warm star sand solution. Uh, star sand's got surfacants and it's got, you know, antimicrobial. And then I'll sort of wipe it off just to get any of that um, wax or whatever they put on the outside of citrus to make them look better than they taste. Um, obviously, you know, pick citrus that you like the aroma of. Uh, we love cara cara oranges, ruby red grapefruits. Um, lemon and lime work, but they can be a little one note, a little harsh. Um, but uh, you know, you can use Buddha hand, you can use uh, Etrog, you can use, you know, whatever, whatever fun things you're know, going to the local, um, you know, specialty fruit market or a local ethnic market. Um, there's a great uh, chain of Korean markets near us that have really fantastic, fun, interesting citrus fruit that we'll often go do for sort of a weekly variant or something like that and do a we did a, a Buddha's Hand a double IPA that was really fun. Um, it's real fun with vanilla. Um, honestly, in sour beers, it's a little harder yet to come through. Sour beers can, are so characterful on their own that whether you're dry hopping or using citrus zest, um, they can really walk all over that. And so it tends to be more of a complexity than it is a um, big punchy flavor. Um, People really like we do a couple of beers that just have like orange juice or pineapple juice or whatever mixed in. And that's really fun if you're just doing a fresh beer and don't worry about um, anything else. Uh, but again, that can ferment if you're planning on uh, bottling it. So it's a little trickier. Awesome. Uh, is there anybody else who's got questions for, for Michael or has a comment even? I've got a question. There you go. Please. Uh, Michael, uh, I'm just curious how uh, in your quick sours or your mixed firms, um, how are you addressing the additional uh, fermentables that you're adding in when you add the fruit? Are you just letting it ride or are you looking to, to kill off any of the, um, any of the bacteria uh, as you go? Just curious how, yeah. how you go in the brewery. We, we don't uh, pasteurize the fruit. My general assumption is that if, if a microbe can come into a 6% alcohol, and so I guess I should say, 
uh, if we are if we are playing if this is a kettle sour or something like that that we're planning on canning and we're running it through our clean gear, generally we are using if it's not citrus zest that we're you know dunking the star sand, we are generally using a prepared product. So an aseptic puree. Um, we've had good luck. There's a couple of companies that do uh, freeze uh, freeze dried juices. I'm sorry, it's not even freeze dried. It's like freeze concentrated. So low temperature. I think they're just pulling a vacuum, um, concentrating it down, and again aseptic, um, just because those beers are pretty ripe for infection. They have probably a little higher final gravity. They don't have a lot of hopping. They're kind of moderate alcohol. Um, and we are just not the scale or don't have the effort to process, pasteurize, and, and dose um, beers like that. For the mixed ferment stuff and the barrel age stuff, that is such a harsh environment. The low pH, the alcohol, they tend to be very dry. Um, I tend to just kind of let it ride. Um, we will often give two or three months. We'll make sure that gravity gets down to or often below where it uh, was before the fruit went in. Um, I've never had any trouble uh, in all my years of home brewing and, and professional brewing of getting an off flavor that I could attribute to microbes from the fruit in a mixed ferment sour beer. Um, I'm sure there are cases where it's happened, um, but I also know of a lot of breweries that love to use some amount of local fruit early in fermentation to allow those wild microbes from the fruit to potentially have an impact on the beer to add some uh, local microflora character and then maybe add a second dose of fruit uh, post souring, post, you know, towards the end of fermentation. Um, Scott's wanted us to do sort of a two seasons fruit beer where we use, you know, peaches from, um, you know, the 2021 harvest uh, in, in the tank and then maybe finish it with a dose of 20, 22 peaches a year later, um, just to get that sort of more saturated flavor. Um, getting fruit in early, there tends to be more um, enzymatic activity that, you know, can free interesting aromatics because the pH is a little bit higher. Once the pH drops really low, you sort of stop getting some of those more interesting ester production, thiol freeing, glycoside breaking, uh, whatever bonds. Um, and so uh, that's, that's been my approach. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of options out there and, and there isn't a, with many of these things, there isn't a right and wrong answer. It's sort of a, how much uh, risk are you willing to take versus how much, um, you know, effort do you have? Great, awesome. Uh, hopefully, Patrick, that answers your question. And uh, that was great. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions or uh, any comments for uh, Mr. Tomfire? Oh wait, uh, uh, yeah, I just saw something from Nolan. Uh, I've got a question about blending two beers with different pH levels. If blending a lower pH beer fermented with some lacto and a PD and PDO with a higher pH beer fermented with Brett only, will the lower pH beer continue to lower the pH of the blend over time in the bottles? Um, <clears throat> the answer is probably not much. Um, so I didn't really get, I mean, it's, it's, I, obviously I could you know, talk about different aspects of sour beer all night, but I didn't really get into like the microbes, exactly what they need and their, their likes and wants and desires. Um, Britannomyces sort of can do its thing no matter what. So if that Brett beer was real funky and you were trying to dilute it out with the just sort of tart lacto whatever beer, um, the Brett will, it will eat hop compounds, wood sugars, uh, dextrins, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a generally a, a hyper attenuator. It will eat the sugars that yeast, that Saccharomyces releases when it autolyzes um, and really will keep pushing even harder in the bottle under pressure for uh, reasons I don't actually really understand. I've, I've never gotten a good explanation for it, but under pressure, Brett really seems to be more expressive, more funky. That said, uh, lacto and PDO need carbohydrates. They need um, you know, dextrins or uh, sugars. 
And so assuming that they are done souring the, the wort that they have access to currently, and the Britannomyces probably has dried its sort of half of the beer out a lot, there won't be much left for the lacto or the, particularly the Pediococcus to um, produce lactic acid from. That said, it does not take much sugar at all for a lot of lactic acid to be produced. Um, uh, Lance Shanner from Omega Labs did some tests where he um, used uh, uh, anti-fungal uh, to make 100% sure there was no yeast and did uh, just lacto pitches. And generally he was only getting a drop of at most like three or four gravity points and the pH was getting down from five into the low threes. Um, so it really doesn't take a lot of sugar to, for, the, for the lacto to make a lot of lactic acid. Um, pH is logarithmic. So it's like the Richter scale or decibels in that like three and a half is 10 times more acidic than four and a half. Two and a half is 10 times again more acidic than three and a half. So it's a hundred times more acidic than four and a half. Um, so the pH numbers can be seemingly like three, three and three, one sound very similar, but it is you know, consider considerably more acidic, um, you know, 50% or 75% more acidic. I can't, the general rule I think is that like half, what is it? 0.4 is five times as acidic, something. My, my logarithmic uh, mental math is not what it used to be, but if you go down like 0.4 pH, I think you're almost quadrupling the uh, amount of acid present because um, it's a, a 10x difference, base 10. Um, and so that's all to say that like, if you mix a uh, Brett beer that finished at four and a super sour lacto beer that finished at 3.2, uh, the blend together might be more like 3.4. It won't be um, an arithmetic mean between those two. You, know, you can't just average three, two and four and get three, six or whatever it would be. Um, you're probably hedging more towards the low end. It also like buffering capacity and all that sort of stuff gets into it. Um, but to generally answer your question after all that, um, if the beer you're blending in is dry, odds are you're not gonna get much more acidity if you're blending in really sweet beer, there is a good chance that that uh, pediococcus would keep working and make more uh, lactic acid. Wow, there's a, there's so <laughs> there's clearly so much I don't know about sour beers. I mean, <laughs> it's a whole other world. <laughs> it clearly is. I mean, uh, I keep uh, I, like I said, I, I I've tasted a, a few that are very approachable. I've tasted some barrel. Uh, barrel aged uh, uh, beers. Uh, I've tasted mixed fermentations, and they all are are quite intriguing. But there's so much I don't know. And jeez, uh, does anybody else have any questions for Michael? I was going to say, Michael. Oh. Uh, I think for anyone interested in blending, I believe yeah. you made a calculator online, and someone else kind of added to it, right? Where you can put in different components of blends and all the numbers, and it will kind of estimate like final carbonation, gravity, pH, right? Yep, uh, Jeff, Jeff Crane, who for uh, uh, years worked at oh, Council Brewing in San Diego as sort of his, his side gig. And now I think he's working with a brewery in Mexico. Um, I haven't had anything from his, his new project, but um, great blogger, great brewer. Um, yeah, and so it was um, <clears throat> a spreadsheet where you could enter in the various components and it was assuming that they were all, you know, the same microbes and the same uh, work that would kind of uh, factor in what you should prime and what you might want to consider for the estimate for how much additional carbonation it would pick up. Um, I, I haven't touched that in a while. Hopefully his version of it is still available online, but it's probably called like the blending priming calculator or something like that. Um, and as sort of a, a final call to make your own sour beer, um, a sour beer is not much more expensive to brew. I mean, if you go to a, a store and see uh, the, the barrel aged bottle section for sour beers, it's probably, you know, I often one bottle is more than a six pack of uh, an IPA or something. But um, really so much of that is the time and the risk and the manual labor that goes into making them. As a home brewer, as long as you're okay, you know, sticking some beer aside. Um, I brewed on 
sort of a double size system for a few years at home. I was making you know 40 liters rather than 20, but almost every batch, you know, I would make a, a Pilsner and half of it got lager yeast and half became a Brett Saison. Um, so I'd have sort of something fresh that I could really enjoy um, and you know feel like I'd gotten rewarded for my my uh, hard hard labor in the backyard or in the garage. Uh, but that also have some beer that would go into the basement to you know be uh, available in you know three months or six months or a year or I mean I, I haven't really homebrewed in three years and I still have a basement full of really fun sour beers that uh, when I'm bored I, I can go down there and um, you know pick out a bottle and go you know I, I haven't called my old buddy Matt in a while you know we brewed this together 10 years ago I should shoot him a text and see if he's got any bottles left and see how he's doing. Um, I think the sour beers have just a little of that, you know, hey, this had um, cherries from the, the tree that my wife and I planted in our backyard, you know, the year we got married that passed away this year. But I've still got a couple of bottles that, you know, those cherries, they're sort of preserved in a way. Um, I think that's to me where, where sour beer becomes, you know, blending, it, it's uh, more art than a science and, you know, it becomes more poetic in a way than, um, you know, a peanut butter, marshmallow, jalapeno stout can, <laughs> can ever hope to be, even if I end up brewing a lot more of those because it's what sells. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, no, th thank you. And if, if anyone does have more questions that we don't get to, or you think of them later, please shoot me an email. And I, I, uh, I'm not good on, you know, Hey, I'm mashing right now. What should I do? But if it's, Hey, I'm playing a blend. Um, I'm happy to, uh, you know, give some advice or whatever, whatever might be helpful. Great. Uh, if, if nobody else has, has any questions, uh, I want to say one. thank you. Oh, oh, there you go, Luke. Okay, so, so this is kind of open-ended. Um, so the only people who seem to really heavily be playing with wine yeasts in beer are you and Scott. And uh, so I'm just kind of like curious if you've done more fiddling around with wine yeast, especially in like mixed fermentation stuff that hasn't been published in a blog post or just kind of thoughts yeah. on wine yeasts. Yeah, so we, um, so wine yeast is interesting. The, the science on wine yeast, I'm not sure it's more advanced. I think it's more public. Um, so a lot of wine yeast labs will tell you, you know, what enzymes it's making and how much glycerin it produces and all those sorts of things. And brewer's yeast uh, companies seem to be a little bit more uh, close to the vest, tight-lipped. Um, you know, we, we've been talking to, uh, particularly Scott has been talking to a lot of yeast lab companies and they'll say, well, you know, you can't tell anyone this, but so-and-so's, you know, New England IPA strain uh, doesn't do any bioconversion and there's yada, yada, yada. Um, and that's the kind of thing that would just be nice if that was, you know, in a nice little grid somewhere, you, you get these studies and they just have, you know, They've ob obfuscated, you know, this is uh, English ale sample one, and this is English ale sample two. And it's interesting, but without knowing what commercial strains those are, it really there's nothing actionable or applicable unless it's like none of the English strains have this gene or that gene. Um, we do a reasonable number of our primary ferments with wine yeast. Uh, dried wine yeast is relatively inexpensive. It's relatively low attenuating. Um, uh, we've done a lot of, and it's that same as on my blog, we've done uh, BM45 for a bunch of these sour reds, including I think the one that just went on to uh, cherries. We've done, oh, what's the one we just used? We just did, uh, we've done some VIN7, which has a lot of fun enzymes. We've done some of the Anchor Alchemy that's a South African company that does a lot of these uh, yeast blends. They're like specifically for um, South African or New Zealand wines that really like push those expressions. Um, all of that said, so that's all fun on the sour side for primary fermentation. Um, and we, and same thing, we'll like try to pitch wine yeast for like when we add fruit, just hoping that though we get some of those fun interactions. Um, on the clean side, uh, we have really been playing a lot with the uh, genetically modified strains. So uh, I think Scott just did a, um, blog post about this not too long ago. Um, we've been using strains from, um, so Berkeley Yeast is a relatively new company that is built their entire business around um, bioengineering um, strains that, you know, uh, really push some particular ester or um, converts. So like we use uh, one they call Tropics a lot. 
um, that, uh, so apparently mulch just has a, a lot of this style uh, 3MH and without any hops, it makes a beer that uh, it frees the style from the malt and big passion fruit aroma. And so it's really fun in fruit beers, it's really fun in IPAs. Uh, Omega Labs has a, a similar strain that's a little bit more subdued called Cosmic Punch that we'll be using in a collab uh, along with uh, Phantasm Powder, which is uh, dried, powdered, uh, super fruity New Zealand wine grapes from a company in New Zealand. And all this stuff, it's it like, um, it turns, it makes me feel like it's my first day brewing. We use a different hop in the Whirlpool and all of a sudden the beer tastes like grapefruit rather than um, you know, pie, that rather than pine trees or whatever we were expecting. Um, a lot of these fruity compounds are generally not found. So a lot of thiols, which are the sulfur compounds that are super low, you know, parts per billion can be above threshold and they're synergistic and all this. A lot of these are just essentially never found in beer when finished beer is tested. Um, and a lot of these, these sort of engineered wine yeast, beer yeast hybrids can often, um, you know, it's, a hundred times over th threshold or whatever. Um, but like dry hopping pulls them out. And so like, it's sort of, it, like we're still trying to figure out like what is the, even like whirlpool hopping can pull them out. Uh, and so we're like playing around with like hop enzyme or we're uh, like hop extracts in the kettle and uh, mash hopping because the mash hopping really pushes these uh, because then you have enzymes in the mash freeing these compounds from the hops. It just, um, you know, like I, I I, mash hopping's always been a thing, but you know we're adding, um, you know what would be typical, you know high whirlpool rates to the mash on some beers and getting um, interesting. It's and it's often like the less um, sexy hops. A lot of the sexy hops have a lot of free compounds. A lot of the less sexy hops have uh, all these bound compounds that are sort of locked away that you wouldn't even notice unless you had the right enzymes or the right yeast to sort of free them up. Um, and also, this is the kind of stuff that, like, I, I'm glad Omega is releasing. Um, I th actually, I don't know if their strain has been um, uh, uh, released to the public, but they've done a couple of their others, Bonanza and um, uh, what was the other one? Um, Sundew are two where they took uh, phenolic brewer's yeast and removed the phenol gene. So, Bonanza is a Hefeweizen strain that doesn't make clove. Sundew is a Belgian ale that doesn't make sort of the peppery character. Um, and they're sort of, those are available to home brewers and they can be a fun sort of addition to an IPA where you want to get a yeast driven fruitiness to complement the hop uh, fruitiness. Um, and so honestly, I mean, it's, I, I know there are a lot of brewers. Um, uh, I think Scott talks about his post, uh, Matt Brindelson from Firestone Walker came out very hard against these as, you know, taking away the, the craft of brewing and why even add hops to a beer? Um, and for us, I mean, it's just, it's another tool. Um, you know, it's it's definitely, you know, we're still adding plenty of hops. We're still hopping at ridiculous rates, but this is a way for us to build in um, depth or complexity or oomph in a way that um, you just can't with hops. Uh, or that, you know, the hops are in these compounds that don't make any flavor impact unless you're able to free them or um, convert them or whatever it is. Um, so I, I think wine yeast was for, for us sort of the um, gateway into that world. And um, we've tried some clean beers with like wine yeast, um, brewers yeast blend. The big issue is a lot of wine yeast are phenol producers and, you know, they can get rubbery, they can get you know, weird. In a sour beer, uh, the Brett will convert those phenols generally into other compounds. So it's much less of an issue, but in clean beers, it's, it's a little dicey. That was very interesting. <laughs> that's, that's what happens when now, uh, rather than thinking about beer, you know, 12 hours a week, I think about beer 70 hours a week. <laughs> um, but no, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully this was, you know, everybody got a little something, whether you were just, you know, just thinking about getting into sour beers or whether you just, you know, enjoy drinking them uh, or you've been brewing sour beers for a while. Um, really appreciate it. I always have fun doing this. Um, I hope, hope that uh, clubs don't stop doing these sort of virtual things. Um, I, I certainly enjoy like traveling to homebrew club meetings and I've been invited, you know, speaking conferences or where, but there's a niceness in just hopping onto my computer and being able to, to spout nonsense and uh, not be, uh, you know, forced to drink, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a, a creative sour uh, that, uh, you know, I, I have to have a, a strong face on uh, that before I tell the guy that it's, uh, you know, pretty, pretty sour, probably a little too sour. Um, but no, it's, it's, uh, it's always fun. It's always great to hear that, you know, people all over the place are uh, making sour beers and interested in them still because uh, that's, you know, hof hopefully my business for the next 30 years. Uh, David, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, David's sorry. back. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. I was about to my, take over. Go ahead. My apologies. So I just wanted to say again, Michael, thank you very, very much for taking the time tonight. I mean, um, uh, I think most people know how busy everybody else is in general, but uh, when you're in demand, like, like yourself and, and some, and uh, you know, some of our other speakers that we've had, it, it, we're really extremely uh, happy and thankful that that you take time out to to talk to us, um, especially because we're not just we're home brewers, but we're we're all we're up here in the uh, in the Great White North, as they say, right? So, <laughs> no, but please, if anyone finds themselves down, and we're we're pretty close to Washington D.C., next to Baltimore, uh, if you find yourself down in this area at some point uh, post pandemic, please uh, you know stop by, say hi. Um, I'm often, you know, sort of around on weekdays. If uh, you, know, you ask a bartender, I'm happy to come out and give you a tour or something like that, particularly with a little advance warning. Um, but yeah, please, uh, you know, stop by, say hi. Um, best of luck brewing and, and let me know if anything uh, uh, unique comes up. Oh, definitely. This is, that's like, it's, uh, it's been great. It's been really great. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody, I, I, but I think I can. <laughs> and just say thank you thank you very very much and uh awesome presentation and uh, uh we really appreciate it so hopefully uh in, in the future i mean i know that uh uh homebrew con next year is in pittsburgh and i know uh that's a stretch so he's you know there's driving but you know we can always make a week of it and just kind of you know head your neck of the woods yeah, I, I went to college in Pittsburgh. There's now there's a lot of great breweries in that area between uh, Dancing Gnome and uh, Penn Brewing and East uh, was it East East Side? I forget what that place is called. But there's a lot of great beer in that area and, and worth worth the trip if you ever make it down there. Awesome. Thanks again, Michael. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks everybody, and uh, thanks for letting me uh, monopolize your meeting. <laughs> Good times. Yeah.